Thanks, Titi. Um, so we've covered uh, in a whistle stop tour metabolic and mitochondrial disease. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Anthony Pentazis, who's a consultant cardiologist at the Royal Brompton and the group's clinical lead for cardiomyopathy, who will talk to us about the cardiac conditions in inherited neuromuscular disease. Um, so over to you, Anthony. Thank, thank you, Paz. Thank you all. Um, let me get my slides up. Sorry, the software wants for an asking is asking for an update, which I have declined. OK, I should be on, right? Yeah, all good. Yes, OK, all right, thank you. So similar to Jerry, I, I, it's a quite broad topic and I will just touch upon a few things and hopefully get some uh, take home messages out. Um, and just to give you an idea of how broad it is, um, the, when we talk about neuromuscular conditions, essentially it's a long, long list of conditions and it's not one single entity there. And of course, one would expect that all these conditions will have a different uh, phenotype in, uh, in the heart as well as in other organs. Um, but we are cardiologists, so we sometimes simplify things and occasionally uh, more than what we should do. And essentially when we when we are interested in the uh, cardiac phenotype of these conditions, we want to know whether the heart is big and dilated and has lost its function or whether there is uh, fast cardiac rhythms or slow cardiac rhythms, which can be uh, life threatening. So this is the, the summary of, of what we usually, um, what we're usually concerned about when it comes to the cardiac phenotype. And I have, for the purpose of, um, you know, giving this talk, I, I have grouped them into uh, three um, different categories. And let's start with the dystrophinopathies. Uh, the muscular dystrophy is not one single disease, it's a collection of disease again, but the most uh, known typical one is Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, because it's the commonest one. And this is uh, caused by the um, lack of a protein called dystrophin. Dystrophin is a very important, very big protein in the cell. You can see it here in yellow. And essentially, this is a genetic condition as, as well as the other conditions that we will be discussing today is progressive and is degenerative. So over the time, it manifests itself with more severe uh, phenotype, not just in the heart, but in the whole body. It's an X-linked disorder, as you probably know already, and, and therefore we expect uh, males to be affected. We'll talk about the females later, whether they are affected or not, but just to give you a hint, they are affected, they can be affected in a number of cases, and we should never uh, miss that. Uh, it's not as rare, it's one in 3,500 male births. Sorry. And to discriminate it from Becker's muscular dystrophy, essentially, it's uh, we look at the, the progression of the disease in the patient and we have some age cutoffs which um, they, they help us discriminate Duchenne muscular dystrophy from Becker muscular dystrophy. The early presentation is Duchenne, the late presentation is Becker. And uh, I will not go into too much detail about this because it's not cardiac and I promise to, to be uh, simple today and just be a cardiologist. Um, important is to, to uh, also have in mind that some markers like the CK uh, are um, are elevated in the in the blood and they can actually give us some idea about the involvement, uh, especially in uh, Becker's and female patients because in the cell muscular dystrophy, I don't think we need to see them in order to make the diagnosis. The presentation in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is, is early, is very early, and um, the diagnosis is usually reached by the age of five, uh, even without the family history um, because of the um, quite uh, loud presentation. The cardiac involvement now, 
is also very significant. And as you can see here, by the age of 10, 60% of the patients will be affected by the cardiomyopathy. And by the age of 20, 100% uh, of the patients will have a cardiac involvement. So it's very unusual uh, to see uh, people in their late teens without any cardiac involvement. And of course, after the age of 20, we, we expect uh, cardiomyopathy, which is usually actually quite severe from that early age. This is a very typical ECG for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I think it's worth uh, commenting on a couple of things here. One of them is the tall R waves in the, in the anterior uh, recorder leads, and the other one is the Q waves uh, here in the um, inferolateral leads, which mimic a myocardial infarction. Maybe not so much on this ECG, uh, but another comment is that the ECG in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is usually tachycardic. And this slide describes what I've just said, actually. Um, the Holter monitor shows uh, sinus tachycardia in, the, uh, in a good number of these patients, and there is a reduction or loss of the circadian rhythm variation in, again, a good number of these patients. Uh, now, the arrhythmia observed in these patients is usually ventricular when there is also significant cardiomyopathy. We don't see so much of supraventricular arrhythmia here, but of course, when the left ventricular ejection fraction is in the 20s and 30s, we see we may see ventricular extrasystole. And of course, the question which we will discuss a little bit more later on is whether this represents a risk factor and whether uh, any uh, prevention of the uh, sudden death and um, the ventricular sustained ventricular arrhythmia is beneficial for these patients. I can warn you already that this is not a question with a with a clear answer. The, the echocardiogram, of course, shows low systolic function and um, <clears throat> the diastolic dysfunction is also present. And the cardiac MRI, which obviously we don't have a lot of data with cardiac MRI because we didn't use to do cardiac MRI in these patients. Uh, a, because cardiac MRI was not so broadly available previously, but also because these patients have a number of obviously mobility issues that are wheelchair, wheelchair bound and therefore to move them in for a cardiac MRI and to go through all the logistics, it, there has to be a good reason. But now that things becoming easier uh, with the logistics and everything else and specialized clinics um, are, um, are, have been established, uh, cardiac MRI is performed more frequently and it, in the majority of these patients there is a fact beyond obviously the low ejection fraction and everything else that we have seen on echo already there is uh, fibrosis usually in the posterior lateral wall which appears to be um, non-specific actually. Now how do we treat these patients um, who don't have a, um, a disease specific treatment and we use heart failure treatment uh, we start beta blockers and ACE inhibitors early, and um, of course we uh, we monitor the cardiac function and we monitor them for the arrhythmia. How often should we monitor them? Again, it's a big question, um, and there aren't any clear answers. After the ejection fraction reaches the the range of 20 to 30 percent, it doesn't usually change very much. So maybe one can argue that there isn't much point of repeating the, the imaging test very often. However, if it drops below 20 percent, then it may be associated with um, new symptoms and uh, cardiac decompensation. Uh, now, a couple of you know um, important points to, to mention here. Uh, I, I already said that primary prevention here is a discussion that is increasing, increasingly held. And this is because obviously primary prevention in dilated cardiomyopathy altogether has been a, a, a completely unknown subject uh, until recently. Uh, and only recently we have started understanding a little bit better how we should evaluate the risk. And therefore, this has been also um, now moved on into areas where dilated cardiomyopathy is caused by specific genetic changes. But the, the truth is that we don't know whether late cardiolinum enhancement, for example, is important in these patients. We don't even know where the, I think that we actually know, but we don't have the data to prove it, that the ejection fraction is not a, a risk market, marker in these patients because there are patients with to say muscular dystrophy who are quite stable for many, many years. They don't suffer um, life-threatening arrhythmia despite the low ejection fraction, which can be in the 20s and 30s for many years. Therefore, I think that 
we should actually look at this population in a completely different way than how we look at the rest of dilated cardiomyopathy. But of course, we, we need more data, we need broader discussions, and we need to individualize the risk assessment. Um, as for the medication used, um, obviously ACE inhibitors are, are, um, are used, as I said earlier, in most of these patients. Uh, beta blockers are also used. Some of these patients have quite low blood pressure and they don't tolerate this treatment in those cases. Alternatives such as ivabradine may have a role because they reduce the autonomic dysfunction of these patients. Well, not the autonomic dysfunction as such, but they reduce the tachycardia, which is secondary to the autonomic dysfunction. And this may be beneficial, um, especially uh, also because it does not affect as much the, the blood pressure. In some of these patients, though, we have to be careful because the, the the increased heart rate is not just a marker of autonomic dysfunction, but is uh, also the, the response to the fact that they have low cardiac output, and therefore they do need increased heart rate to maintain some cardiac output, and it's not appropriate to completely block uh, and reduce uh, the heart rate. But that's why I said earlier that it has to be individualized. The embark comment down there is not a comment, actually it's just a word. It's just to remind me that genetic therapies are coming. Uh, we are still early in this field, but uh, progress is happening. So in the next few years, we may see genetic therapies uh, available for these patients. Very briefly, uh, because I'm also looking at the time, uh, Duchenne uh, females carriers, they, they sometimes manifest. And when they, mani uh, when they manifest, we have to actually pick up the uh, diagnosis early because they may have complications from this diagnosis. They may go into a dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Uh, this is an example here, an echocardiogram of a female Duchenne patient in her 70s. This one I don't think it will play, but it doesn't matter. You can see that the right ventricle here is dilated with thin and aneurysmal areas. And the only diagnosis in this patient was that she was a Duchenne female a carrier patient. So she, that was what, this is what has caused these uh, right ventricular changes. Now, moving on to myotonic dystrophy, um, which is the most common muscular dystrophy in adult patients. Again, um, it's a genetic disease. This one is caused by the expansion of a trinucleotide. Uh, trinucleotide repeats, which uh, if they are above 50, uh, then um, they, uh, they uh, cause disease. Uh, in terms of the cardiac involvement, here we have slightly different phenotype or maybe significantly different phenotype in some cases because uh, the difference between between Duchenne muscular dystrophy and myotonic is that in Duchenne we, we discussed a lot about the, the systolic dysfunction, where here the electrical changes may actually uh, manifest themselves much earlier. And these are um, conduction delays uh, in the form of first degree uh, heart block, QRS prolongation, uh, left and right band block less frequently. And the patients may also have uh, atrial arrhythmia. Uh, heart failure does uh, um, is part of the phenotype in, in sorry in myotonic uh, dystrophy. Uh, maybe not uh, very frequent, but uh, de depending how we define the cardiac dysfunction, maybe a third or a fourth of these patients do have cardiac dysfunction. Not necessarily failure, though. Um, we don't have um, in the reality very good predictors of the phenotype, but. Um, some studies have shown that the increased uh, number of repeats may actually correlate with the presence of uh, VLV systolic dysfunction. These patients do suffer sudden death, and, and this is a big difference from what we have been discussing so far. And the sudden death ha may have two different mechanisms. One is the complete heart block, and the second mechanism is that some of these patients suffer ventricular tachycardia and they die of that. So when initially the complete heart block was discovered in these patients and some of them had pacemakers implanted, obviously uh, there was an observation that some of these patients still died with a pacemaker in situ, with a working pacemaker in, in situ, and this was because they had ventricular arrhythmia. Now, how do we predict who uh, needs a pacemaker? Well, it's not very precise science, but a retrospective study in patients who already had pacemakers so there were a lot of weaknesses in the study, showed that a, a critical um, HV interval of uh, 70 or longer milliseconds is an indication for a pacemaker. Interestingly, we haven't got, this is a quite old study, but interestingly, we haven't got much better predictors until now, although a number of studies have suggested a number of different markers. 
Now, in terms of the ventricular tachycardia, uh, it's difficult, very difficult to predict in these patients. Uh, markers such as the atrial arrhythmia, the severe abnormalities uh, and the severe QR prolongation have been suggested. The presence of atrial arrhythmia may also be um, a predictor of sudden death. Uh, again, this is not precise science, but looking at these markers, if a, if a patient has all these markers, and very importantly, if the patient is going to have a pacemaker because we have slow rhythm on the ECG or slow rhythms on the holter monitor or long HB interval, then of course the pacemaker should be the fibrillator. Um, electrophysiological studies can be helpful, but the problem with them is that we don't have very good um, uh, guidance when to do them. And of course, these patients have a chronic progressive disease. If we start doing them at the age of whatever, 20, how often do we repeat them? Um, we can't, uh, th there has been some data showing that there is no good association between the surface ECG and the findings of the electrophysiological study. Therefore, if we start doing them, we should be repeating them every year, and I'm not sure that the yield is actually good. However, if we have an electro electrophysiological study with findings suggestive, uh, as I said earlier, HV longer than 70, that can be used for a pacemaker uh, implantation. For the VT uh, um, and provo provocation of VT is not particularly helpful. Um, let's skip this one and this one. Um, it's important that these patients are monitored very carefully because as I said, they can develop um, dysfunction of the ventricle, which is more progressive and in a, in a way less of a concern because it will happen slowly over the years, but can also develop complete heart block or ventricular arrhythmia, which is more of a concern because it can happen suddenly and cause sudden death. Let's not discuss this. And this one is a summary of what I've said earlier about the difference between Duchenne and myotonic. Now, finally, Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, I could have given this to Jerry actually because essentially it's a, met it's a mitochondrial disease, but it's usually considered, it's usually discussed together with the neuromuscular diseases. Uh, it's uh, an inherited ataxia. Uh, we have the expansion of GAA here, an intronic GAA, and uh, at the end we have a lack of uh, loss of uh, frataxin, which is a small uh, protein. Um, it presents with a number of neuromuscular um, symptoms and signs. As for the heart, it causes cardiac uh, uh, hypertrophy and areas of necrosis. Um, and also we can see uh, diffuse fibrosis in post-mortem specimens, but also now with cardiac MRI. Now, you may see here that I call it FA cardiomyopathy. And the reason for that is that many years ago, there was a long discussion whether this is hypertrophic or dilated or type of hypertrophic and so on. And the easy solution has been by Weidemann and other colleagues actually, uh, that this is actually a specific Friedrich's ataxia cardiomyopathy, which doesn't fit into the other uh, boxes and has a number of features which I'll try to summarize for you. The ECG is quite uh, typical uh, actually for uh, in Friedrich's ataxia cardiomyopathy and looks like this. Um, the, you, you, you may see here the T-wave inversion in the inferolateral leads um, and otherwise not much uh, to, to observe, but this T-wave inversion is actually very common and can be observed in about 90% of the patients, even without any structural changes on cardiac imaging. Patients without the T-wave inversion uh, have actually excellent prognosis and they're not expected to have a severe uh, phenotype later in life, a uh, cardiac phenotype. Another important marker is the age of presentation, the age of diagnosis. Um, uh, those who present very early are more likely to have cardiac phenotype uh, than those who present late. Usually the hypertrophy, when it's hypertrophic, is symmetrical, so affects all the segments. And then it can progress into normal thickness, which is not a, a, a positive thing here and to dilate cardiomyopathy. And this is what we will see on echocardiography and cardiac MRI if we do them um, uh, over a number of years. Sometimes the actual, the wall thickness, if we, when we measure it is not above the normal range, but the relative wall thickness is increased. And in terms of arrhythmia, these patients do have atrial arrhythmia, less of ventricular arrhythmia. And um, the, the, the atrial arrhythmia is actually um, a quite significant marker of uh, cardiac and ventricular dysfunction.
uh, what these what do these patients die of it's debatable uh, certainly the cardiac causes of death uh, are present but i think that sometimes uh, it's a complex mechanism of death including the, the lungs uh, and uh, uh, respiratory problems. Uh, cardiac treatment is not specific. We usually use beta blockers and calcium antagonists for chest pain and uh, the arrhythmia. Sometimes questions like anticoagulation when there is atrial fibrillation are important to us. There's no clear answer, but we need to take into, into consideration also that these patients are prone to falls, at least until they become wheelchair bound, and then it's safer to use anticoagulation. And of course, these patients, if they if they don't uh, if they are not severely affected by uh, in any other organs, at some point, if they have dilated cardiomyopathy, they may uh, raise the question of cardiac transplantation. Now, previous trials did not show any uh, drugs uh, very efficient for the heart. Although idebenon, for example, has been good for neurological uh, symptoms. Nowadays, we have a new drug uh, which is an NRF two activator essentially it's a, a transcription factor that reduces inflammation uh, and this has uh, i think they has been uh, now approved by fda to uh, to be fast tracked uh, it's a drug that we have actually tried here at the brompton as well uh, we, we participated in the moxi study uh, running the cardiac uh, the cardiac evaluation of these patients in in london and I didn't see any improvement, to be honest, but but it was a safe drug and didn't cause any cardiac uh, side effect. But the improvement is actually also relevant to what stage of the disease these patients are recruited for the study. And I'll close here by returning to this slide. Uh, the uh, neuromuscular conditions are many. Uh, it's important to know the, the underlying condition and understand what to expect. Uh, of course, the cardiac phenotypes are also very variable. Uh, they can be quite severe sometimes, and one has to have you know, good understanding of the disease and monitor these patients quite carefully and discuss the decisions with colleagues because it's a multidisciplinary uh, environment that what is best for these patients. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Antonis. An incredible um, overview of a very, very complex area. And I think I and a lot of others will have a lot of questions for you and Jerry, um, which we'll bring out in our panel discussion.